William Shakespeare mentions dozens of different kinds of birds in his work, everything from wrens to doves to jays, but the bard mentions one particular bird in a tragedy he wrote called Coriolanus. Uh, that's the name of the play, not the name of the bird. And it's a play he wrote around the same time that he did uh, Antony and Cleopatra and Macbeth. And it's a tragedy about Roman general Caius Marcius, who later in the play is given the title Coriolanus. And it's pretty ripe with bird symbolism, actually. In Act 3, Coriolanus compares himself to a mighty eagle and the common folk to crows. And there's a point in the play, oh, and I'll give you a spoiler warning, even though you've had 400 years to read it, so come on. There's a point in the play where Coriolanus gets exiled from Rome. He seeks an old enemy slash best friend slash a guy who's definitely in love with him named Tullus Aphidius to help him get revenge on Rome. And anyway, this is where we're coming full circle back to birds. Aphidius compares Coriolanus to an osprey, saying, I think he'll be to Rome as the osprey is to the fish, who takes it by sovereignty of nature. So today, we're talking about ospreys and why they're my favorite bird. Okay, so why was all that important about Coriolanus and Roman generals? Well, all the birds I mentioned, crows and jays and wrens, and most of the others Shakespeare wrote about are European cousins to the ones you would find here, in Bolsa Chica in California, except for the osprey. See, the osprey is a bird found all over the world on every continent except Antarctica. Almost anywhere you have a body of water, especially the ocean, you'll find ospreys. Shakespeare wrote about them, Aristotle did too. Ospreys are the subject of the first poem in Shi Jing, which is an old collection of Chinese poems, and the one about ospreys, titled Guanju, dates to the 7th century. They were possibly mentioned in the Bible, uh, were maybe the subjects of a lot of northern Native American mythology, uh, and are seen as far south in the world as South Africa and Australia. In fact, ospreys are so widespread that scientists have considered using them as sort of a global litmus test for evaluating the Earth's health. My point is, ospreys are everywhere, and can connect people around the globe. The ospreys we'll see today are the same kind that you could see in France or Brazil. They're a very tangible example of the way that nature permeates across international borders and across oceans, and I think that's pretty neat. But hold on, why here? If ospreys are so widespread, what is it about the context of Southern California that makes them so interesting? Well. To answer that, we have to go beyond the realm of Pandion haliatus, which is the osprey we all know and love, and look to its extinct cousin, Pandion homoloptera. These two species, haliatus and homoloptera, share the same genus, Pandion. And Pandion homoloptera, while no longer with us here on Earth, was discovered in California, about three hours that way. And it is the oldest confirmed finding of a specimen in the genus uh, Pandion. So you could say that even though the osprey is a bird you could find all over the world, the earliest place we knew it existed in some capacity was right here at home. So why near water? It's not exactly a tricky answer, ospreys eat fish. But saying that doesn't quite do an osprey justice. So really quickly, let's circle back to that quote about Coriolanus. I think he'll be to Rome as the osprey is to the fish, who takes it by sovereignty of nature. Aphidius has a lot of respect for Coriolanus as a soldier. Even though they're enemies, Aphidius knows that Coriolanus is so adept at war and killing that he's practically a force of nature. And while an osprey isn't leading Roman armies into battle, they must hunt every time they want a meal. And they're so equipped for it, so well designed to kill, that the comparison between the relationships of fish osprey and Rome Coriolanus seems very fitting. The belief was that a fish will simply yield to an osprey if the bird wants to eat it. And while that's not exactly true, an osprey's success rate is no less than 1 in 4, and as high as up to 70%. And if I were a fish, I know I wouldn't like those odds. All right, so there we got our first look at an actual osprey. Um, I'm glad that we found one because that would have been embarrassing if we came all the way here and there weren't any ospreys. <laughs> I got my mask on because there's a lot more people walking by. Um, and we're over here by the water. This osprey is sitting on this dead tree um, over here by the water because an osprey's preferred spot to catch a fish is just below the water's surface. And they'll typically perch on a tree overlooking the water as we can see it, scanning and getting a feel for where they think they might like to go. Um, and when they finally decide they're ready, they'll take off into the air, spend some time circling, look around some more, and when they find a fish they like, they'll dive into the water from up to 100 feet in the air, uh, and are able to get up to 3 feet below the water's surface. They'll then fly back to their perch or their nest to eat their prey.
Ospreys are very easily identifiable when perched. Uh, you can see our guy up there is preening right now. Um, but they have a very characteristic dark eye stripe on both sides of their head. They got a wickedly hooked bill. Um, they have a brown mottled stripe across their otherwise white breast. And they have remarkably strong feet. Ospreys aren't picky birds. And there's a word for that. We call them generalists. More than 80 species of fish make up most of an osprey's diet. Uh, and that's just in North America. Part of the reason they're able to live all over the world is because they'll eat basically any kind of fish they can find there. And to look at how they're able to do that so well, let's dive into some of the characteristics we talked about earlier. See what? Dive? Do you get it? You know, now and again, I go entire days without looking in a mirror because the sight of you makes me physically and emotionally nauseous. You like and, and you know what saturates the, the remainder of my time? Even on the outside. Nothing at happy. all. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. You can't roast the time I'm calling you tall. As a fishing generalist, an osprey has to be ready to actually ingest anything it catches. And just like any raptor, it has a heavily hooked bill to help it do that. But where an osprey stands, apart from other birds of prey are its feet. Look at this image of an osprey foot compared to other birds of prey. What do you notice? Uh, first, look at how muscular this foot is. Also, look at how much longer and more curved these claws are, generally speaking, than many of the others it shows. That makes these claws great for holding on to slippery fish. But the most striking difference you may notice is the toe arrangement. Most raptors have a toe arrangement like this one, with three toes in the front and one in the back. Ignore my pinky, pretend it's not there. So the typical 3-1 shape we call anisodactyl, while the 2-2 two two arrangement that the osprey has we call zygodactyl. And if you're wondering, yes, the dactyl is the same dactyl from pterodactyl. It means fingers or toes. But here's where things get really cool and weird and complicated. An osprey's toe arrangement isn't exactly totally zygodactyl. All right, so we're on the other side of the marsh now looking at that osprey. It's just a tiny speck. Okay, so yes, a two in front, two in back arrangement is zygodactyl for cuckoos and woodpeckers and many other birds. But an osprey's foot actually doesn't look like this all the time. An osprey has what's called a semi-zygodactyl foot, which means it can actually rotate its fourth toe to be with the first one in the back, or it can rotate it to be with toes two and three in the front. And ospreys definitely take advantage of this. Um, they're known to exhibit a zygodactyl toe formation during predatory activity, but they will typically rotate their fourth toe back to the front when perched. And I bet you thought ospreys couldn't get any cooler. So as we talked about a lot already, ospreys eat lots of different kinds of fish. But no matter what kind of fish they catch, they do something pretty unique with it. It might seem instinctual, if you were a bird, to hold a fish like this. But that's not what an osprey does. Oh, no, no, no. An osprey holds a fish like this. Can you figure out why? Here's three seconds to think about it. Yeah, that's right. It's because it's aerodynamic. You know when you have your hand out of a car window like this, and you can feel the air pushing against you, and then you turn your hand like this, and the car starts going 20 miles an hour faster? That's what an osprey does. It's the same reason that rockets launch like this and not like this. Osprey's no rocket science, dude. OK, so I just want to talk about, talk about one more thing, and then we'll call it a day. I'm stuttering on my skateboard because I'm awful at riding it. OK, so there are only two animals in the entire animal kingdom that we know about that exhibit some kind of left-right preference, humans and ospreys. Like when you ride a scooter or a skateboard, typically you have one foot forward. Like I, my left light preference is to have my right foot forward. When ospreys do the thing we just talked about, carrying their fish parallel to the direction of movement, they have a left-right preference. Some ospreys have their right foot forward. Some ospreys have their left foot forward. And for this reason, I think ospreys are a great example of an animal distantly related to us that can show how all life, all of us, are connected. Something as simple as left-right preference is an exhibition of the small things that bridge evolutionary time and forge the bonds in our tree of life. And for this and each of the other reasons we've talked about, semi-zygodactility, a worldwide distribution, 100-foot dives, all that is why ospreys are my favorite bird. Okay, so what have we learned today? We learned that uh, Coriolanus was a bird 
uh, the dead osprey cousin was, was found here in California. And now ospreys are everywhere. Uh, ospreys have zygodactyl feet, but not always. Uh, rockets don't launch sideways. Uh, you and ospreys each have a left-right preference for which foot you use when you do stuff. Does that mean that you're an osprey? Uh, wow, that's quite a bit of stuff that we learned. What a worthwhile and rewarding time that I had. I hope you had fun going on this birding adventure with me. I know I did here in beautiful Bolsa Chica. Uh, I'll see you guys next time.